day and um, I know a couple of you have already started this morning so as I said I hope you had a great session. Um, today's module is titled uh, Colonial Legacies and uh, the lecture will be given by Ranabia Samada. Um, unfortunately Shalini Randeria can't be here with us today. I think I mentioned that yesterday that she's uh, bound up with her um, increased commitments due to her being now the president of the Central European University. Unfortunately, she can't be here. So um, you'll have to bear with me as a chair. Um, um, and yes, so uh, let me quickly introduce Rana Samada, who is a distinguished chair uh, of the Calcutta Research uh, Group, a research group um, that has, I think, uh, since the mid 1990s being committed to, let's say, um, scholarly activism or activist scho <laughs> scholarly work on um, peace, democracy, citizenship, human rights, and migration, um, just to name a few. Uh, Ranabir himself has published extensively on issues of justice, peace, nationalism, post-colonial statehood, and uh, migration. He's author of a three-volume study on Indian nationalism um, and has published, for example, other work on materiality of um, politics and the emergence of the political subject and many more. His most recent book being um, The Post-Colonial Age of Migration, which was published in 2020 uh, with Routledge and um, which we were able to read a chapter of um, for today. Um, I'm not going to say much, but I just, uh, I was already hinting at that um, in the readings for today, you clearly underline this importance of the understanding of colonial governmental um, policies and the whole science calculation, categorizations, the whole logics behind them um, in order to grasp what you call the post-colonial destiny that awaits the entire world. Um, but you also draw a, a clear connection between um, ecological destruction, migration, and precarious labor. Um, in other words, sort of between what we were hinting at yesterday, extractivism, and what you call the return to primitive modes of accumulation. And especially the point of labor was something where I think um, also Sandro's comments yesterday sort of left us with. So I'm curious about your talk today and um, yeah, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I attended the plenary session. I attended the plenary session yesterday. And uh, as I said that uh, nothing could have been more defeating as the <coughs> foundational or the inaugural lecture. Uh, some of the things that I want to uh, discuss with all of you today have been anticipated uh, by my dear friend uh, Sandro Mezatra. Uh, there are a few other things uh, which uh, I may mention, but I think he mentioned the important ones. But also some of the other considerations uh, linked with the theme, but also uh, they cropped up in my mind in the last few days as I had been thinking of the theme. So it will be a bit of a rambling discussion, not a very prepared lecture, uh, because I take this as an opportunity to think through the whole thing further. And uh, you may have noticed that the very few uh, uh, readings that I suggested, I had the heading Extractive Capitalism Colonial Milieu, and then within bracket I wrote a post-colonial account. Now, uh, you may say that uh, what is there to write uh, in the bracket and why mention it specifically? Uh, the reason is, and I want to flag this, and I think Sandro mentioned it yesterday, but I will reinforce the point with my own understanding. And I should also mention at the beginning that uh, I'm not very conversant with the global literature on that. I'm 
limited in my readings, but my understanding of South Asia is uh, on the whole uh, okay. So uh, the references that I have given and the references that I have in mind, uh, partly my own work in the past, but partly work of others I shall refer to. So they lead me to this introductory remark that colonialism depended to a great extent on extraction of resources is not something new. We are not the first ones who are thinking of that. If you read the anti-colonial literature, again, I will not mention uh, the global literature. I'm not conversant with that. But the in India, the nationalists in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, in indeed the first writings of, you may say, what is national political economy, so the national political economy, political economy as a science that was developing in a colony, it spoke of what is very famous in, in economic history called the wealth drain. And the wealth drain, this phrase was used again and again by nationalist thinkers. And they detailed how in terms of human resources, in terms of life expectancy, in terms of uh, gender differentials on many counts, in terms of wealth, agricultural produce, trade, cotton cultivation and the impact of that, all these came into discussion. And today, particularly, one of our friends and collaborators, Sandro also knows him very well, probably better than I. Uh, Ned Rossiter, who has written a book on infrastructure, logistics and labor, devotes a chapter, very insightful chapter, but I wish he had expanded on that, uh, titled as Imperial Infrastructure. And Ned Rossiter revisits the age of colonial infrastructure building from 1840 to 1880, railway lines, but more importantly, telegraph poles, cables, all these things came at that time, which needed a reordering of land, and territory as land. So much so that one of the very early anti-colonial pamphlet writer in Bengal uh, wrote a pamphlet or a manifesto called in Bengali Railo Khal, which means rail and the canals. And he argued that in order to set up the railways and in order to set up the uh, telegraph poles, the colonial authorities had to destroy the surface of the land. They had to cut the canals that would flow from the rivers to the interior of the country and the natural drainage was lost or the drainage that had been put in place by native rulers. And this author Shokharam Ganesh Devshkar goes into details to show how it increased or it increased the incidence of malaria, life expectancy was dramatically affected adversely for the time being, but much more important, agricultural productivity went down. Floods became a common occurrence with no outlet for the flood water to go down and the agricultural 
landscape was damaged forever with this. But there are other writings also. And the wealth drain theory, of course, went into trade, commerce, uh, monetization of Indian economy in a big way. Basically, what I am trying to say is the, is the realization that colonial rule depended on extraction of resources, including human resources, life resources, is not a new realization. It was there in the anti-colonial literature and the first awakening of the nationalist consciousness began with the particular nature of colonial economic operations. The main arguments in the current discussion of the uh, theories on extractive capitalism, the main discussion uh, by the, you know, the current theories of extractive capitalism, unfortunately omits the anti-colonial literature of the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, therefore, there is a, uh, how would I put it, a slight, not a major, but it is good to point out a misdirection in the discussion. Uh, partly because, as I said, that this is this realization is not new, that it is built in the colonial mode, uh, the extractive way of ruling, uh, the extractive way of uh, the operation of capital. And as I said, the early writings of the nationalist economic historians and nationalist economics, anti-colonial economists, even in China and in other countries, you would find the, the, the same thing. And this neglect uh, reflects not only on the current debates, but this reflect this neglect also reflected on the nationalist rulers who assumed power consequent upon independence and forgot the way extraction functioned as the basis of modern political economy. I think one of the important lessons to learn, apart from academic interest in what was discussed in these writings in the colonies, uh, it would be interesting to see how the element call or the property called land was discussed. It will be interesting to see how the idea of credit was discussed, how the idea of bank was discussed. But apart from an academic interest or the or interest in historical semantics, how words have taken their own lives in anti-colonial settings, uh, I think it is important to see that the life of capitalism as a global order very much depended on extraction of resources. Partly, therefore, Rosa Luxemburg's and others, this whole debate about the outside of capital and inside of capital is partly, therefore, misdirected. Uh, uh, it is important if we look into the discussions of that time, it is important to realize that capitalism became a global order only with the help of its extractive mode. And that extraction helped trade to flourish, to conquer new territories, shape and reshape borders and boundaries of all kinds. 
extraction therefore has always been a global feature and we had been hither to making i'm not saying that making the distinction is wrong it is important to make categorical distinctions but at the same time it is equally important not to overextend the distinction or draw it to an absurd extent and understand that what we call capitalist economy has built in it what we now say the historical period of colonial economy. The colonial order was a capitalist order. Uh, and the capitalist order could not have been so without the colonial element. Uh, and Marx's writings uh, Sandro yesterday gave very important indications to uh, to uh, volume three of Capital and of course the last part of volume one. But my plea would be that one would have to probably read with equal interest or maybe with more historical interest. Marx's writings in his dispatches to the, uh, I think, New York Herald Tribune or International Herald Tribune, I've forgotten the exact name of the newspaper. But there Marx speaks of India and how rent is extracted, how taxes are levied, what kind of revenues are sought and received by the colonial rule. Uh, I'm reminded of his writings on China. And his long commentaries on the contemporary colonial economy and rule, as uh, Ulrich was mentioning, the way government was functioning, they're extremely enlightening. And so, Today, the, the conclusion that I want to draw, but of course you have to take the conclusion within limits, that if today, again, there is this talk of extractive capitalism, reemergence of extraction at a worldwide scale, it must then alert us to the re-emergence of, I wouldn't say colonial order, but there are many things belonging to that period, but re-emerging today, of course, in different forms and different uh, shapes. We can't compare the two. Uh, the, therefore, the simultaneity of the extractive mode the industrial mode, the financial mode, which were characteristic of the colonial time. Think of the British in India who set up heavy industries. Uh, at the same time, we have to think of the British who opened up forests for mines. And we can think of the British who then set up banks and the private finance started in a modern way in India. Uh, we can see that the simultaneity of various modes of accumulation, they are happening today. That simultaneous simultaneity is a feature of our time. And one need not overemphasize the other at the, at the cost of uh, the validity of others. But I think what is equally interesting and what is not taken into account is the mark that this colonial history left on the quote and unquote metropolis. Uh, I am thinking of Christopher Hills, uh, you know, a historian who probably was probably one of the finest of the 
British historians ever we have seen. Christopher Hill, his writings on levelers and diggers, his writings on the whole how the commons were destroyed, uh, his writings on the on the 17th century Britain, England. Or there are other accounts which show that what is today called in history Atlantic slavery, that this did not happen all of a sudden, that this had much to do with what was happening in England, in the way in which, let us say, not only land was being enclosed and therefore peasants were fighting against that, but also uh, the kind of the antinomian movements that were there, uh, you had, uh, you did not have the existence of modern racism at that time. There were black priestess, one, one would find in the records of that time, there would be others who would do much more imaginative interpretation of the Bible. There were many others, pamphleteers, organizers, who would try to forge a common front of the soldiers, the market women. Uh, you would find records of a market mutiny in Naples reaching England within two years and uh, enthusing and inspiring similar kind of quote and unquote mob to rise up, who in fact in their manifestos would say again and again, we do not want to go to Jamaica, we don't want to go to Barbados, we don't want to cross the Atlantic. So who were forced to cross the Atlantic? Who were sold as slaves? And before the blacks were sold as slaves, whites were being sold as slaves. Extraction in the way it appeared in England had much to do with the rise of modern slavery. So I think all I'm trying to say, this is a long history. In fact, there's a very fantastic book. I should have given it a reference, but I didn't have that in mind. I was in a hurry. I think if the name of the book is, if I'm not wrong, The Many-Headed Hydra, it's, it's a history of the uh, kind of what he calls the rebellious Atlantic history from the 15th, early 16th, late 16th century. And uh, it begins with actually a reference to Shakespeare's uh, Tempest. Shakespeare being one of the uh, shareholder of the first Atlantic uh, shipping company, which was going to prospect and to find out what they could be, what could be done. And the, uh, the ship is run aground because of storm. And we know what Shakespeare, it's a famous uh, play. But it's a real thing. It is based on something very real. What was happening in 1610, 1620, 1630, but certainly by 1630s, you find in many quote and unquote metropolitan countries, the process which we would later characterize as a colonial process. So this is a debate which need to be uh, discussed because unfortunately, again, and uh, let me, uh, you know, go ahead, make a little detour uh, it is interesting uh, in order to reflect on the colonial history of extraction is that the kind of history that Christopher Hill has written and others wrote, uh, I'm thinking of Peter Lindbergh and many, actually two, three very fine radical American historians who are writing on that. They show that what Gramsci would later on characterize that passive revolution and want to uh, how would I put it, uh, with all respect to him, want to uh, counterpose the, uh, the, the model of English Revolution or French Revolution with the fate of an Italian Revolution that doesn't happen. And it is a theory that many post-colonial you know, theorists uh, take up and develop. And it has great insights. But this model of revolution, as opposed to the model of revolutions that do not happen, and therefore the path of passive revolution, is perhaps historically a flawed one. Because even within the English Revolution, uh, with the start of Cromwell, let us say, you have the counter-revolution happening within revolution. The English Revolution 
the revolution that was to be in that sense did not take place. And if we think of what is called in, in the English history of 1648, the Putney debates, where the soldiers and the commoners, they stand up against Cromwell and say, this is in fact what we wanted. This is why we supported the commoners. This is why we supported the parliamentarians. And this is not what we had fought for. We don't want to go to the United States. We don't want to enslave others. We don't want to make any distinction between black and whites. We don't want the lands to be cordoned off, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these great manifestos and the defeat in 1648, 1649, 1650, with mass executions and suppression, you have the rise of modern colonial. The same history what is to be found in, I think, in 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 Netherlands. But I think one of the, again, fantastic writings where you can see that colonialism operates within the metropolitan operations and therefore uh, it has to be understood very clearly is by the Spanish jurist, I'm forgetting his name, someone should remind me, who was uh, the UN reporter on the rights of the indigenous people, very famous jurist, who actually piloted the the uh, convention on the indigenous people's rights and who wrote uh, an article uh, not article actually a very lengthy tract called eight words that make this infamous word genocide and there he argued that these 18 constitutions which went into making the u.s constitution all of them were united on one thing how to institute the legal regime of private property, and for that, how they had to expropriate the American Indians. It's a long history, but again, which shows that extraction, suppression, authoritarian rule, all that you have uh, mentioned in your short statement of the program, I think that's wonderful. And so that has to be uh, taken into, into account. This, the the uh, the extension of plantations and railway construction is again something that uh, we can you know recall i mean i'm thinking of uh, the dutch anthropologist jan bremen uh, his book on taming the coolie beast uh, the chinese coolies in southeast asia which records in details not only the annual floods in China, I mean, something that Pearl Burke immortalized in a novel, Good Art, on, on China, but this massive <coughs> outflow of, of peasants and the induction of the Chinese peasants at school is in the plantations of Malay, Indonesia, but particularly one, followed by the import of Chinese labor to United States and Canada to build the railway lines. And now you have only very recently, maybe in the last 10, 15 years, Chinese historians are going back to that time, 1840s, 1850s to 1870s, when Irish labor is replaced by Chinese labor in the United States. And uh, the Chinese labor becomes very crucial in setting up the railway lines. But it is around that time, actually, the development of Californian Valley begins from 1860, 70 to 1930, 40, tomato cultivation. And there are many other things. Again, a very good environmental history, probably one of the finest of its time. Uh, the name of the, the account is um, Rivers of Empire, or Empires, I think Rivers of Empire, and uh, there it is shown actually how labor mobility depends on the conjunction of three things. One, uh, massive amount of exploitation of land in a particular manner with the development of commercial crops. Second, the change in the land utilization pattern uh, with the disaster, environmental disaster that it brings in. And third, causing a shift in the labor uh, 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 demographic pattern 
in this case, but there are many other cases in India, as I said, that histories abound of migration. I myself have written uh, in details about the uh, growth of the uh, tea plantations in the Northeast. But if you come to today's time and forget, uh, you know, not forget, but leave those accounts to the historians who are doing fantastic work, you can again see that a plantation kind of economy is appearing in other segments of the once uh, colonies. In 2008, the Beijing Olympics took place. And uh, I'm just trying to indicate how colonial patterns reappear. And by there is a Supreme Court, there was a Supreme Court committee which uh, gave its report, I think, in 2015. And it was set up in 2011, which was set up as a result of massive casualty among laborers in what you may call as the uh, artisanal and small scale mining in India. Uh, the, a French photographer uh, uh, did a series of photographs on the Bellari mines in Karnataka. These were massive mines. Uh, 2003-04 to 2008-09 was when the world saw a untold of upswing in steel prices, partly because of the Beijing Olympics. Worldwide, there was a great demand of iron ore, iron ore. And you find, therefore, this is only one instance of how extraction actually influences then the what you may call in technically the commodity prices. Of course, labor as commodity is involved there, labor power as commodity. But more importantly, what I'm trying to indicate is that coffee, sugar, in this case, iron ore, but there are other crucial things. Gold and silver, of course, is there. But if you leave them aside, the commodity prices become one indicator of how the process of extraction becomes crucial and central to the life of capitalism. Now, Bellary Mines, this was, you can't believe that this was a 10,000 crore of Indian rupees. I do not know how much it will be in dollars or in euro. Uh, we have to calculate that. But it is a good amount or a massive amount by Indian standard. And this was completely unlicensed and informal mine. Unbelievable. It hadn't happened in that to that scale in India. And two brothers who were leaders of uh, a right-wing political party in complete public eye and with complete knowledge of the government and all legal authorities operated those mines. There are accounts of how prostitution began accounts of how workers died in large numbers, accounts of accidents, but accounts of also unfathomable profits made by these iron ore miners, uh, mining companies, legal and illegal operations. Included. You have similar accounts of Indonesia. You have other accounts of Chittagong uh, uh, port, where uh, uh, you know uh, uh, dismantling of old ships are done. But what I'm trying to say is that this process of extraction then actually proliferates the small scale and the artisanal level of production. So you have, uh, to give you one example, near my own state, uh, there is again, there are reports and I have written on that. I think I have given one reference to that in, uh, in uh, I'm forgetting what's the name of the article that I referred to. I think it is called, yes, Theorizing Transit Labor in Informal Mineral Extraction Processes in a book called Between the Plow and the Pig, Informal Artisanal and Small-Scale Mining in Contemporary World. Now, there I showed, uh, I uh, uh, wrote on what is called rat hole mines in the hills of the northeast of India, particularly in the northeast of Bengal. Uh, now, these rattle mines are on hill slopes where they actually go vertical, the mines. And these are called rattles because they are small, they are not legal. 
child labor from Nepal, from north of Bihar, north of West Bengal, uh, uh, Bangladesh, northeast, labor below 18 years, 16 years of age, garland boys, they all go there and they are employed in mining. A mobile phone with the light on is stretched on their head. That's the only lamp that the miner has, and these child miners enter. Untold number of deaths. It is estimated that an annual, on an average, probably 200 children have died. And the position is such that in 2000, maybe 13 or 14, the labor minister in Meghalaya, that state, was asked, why don't you do something about it? And the answer is said that if I bring this to the notice of law, then on one hand, these famish children who are etc. etc. who are thereby securing their livelihood, uh, I do not know what will happen to them. And they, they, they come in thousands each year. And like migratory birds, they go back also during the rainy season. On the other hand, if I want to improve labor condition, this is illegal because by the Indian constitution, children below 14 years of age, and now I think it has been made 16, children below 14 years of age, child labor is illegal. So how can I improve the condition of an illegal labor? Legal. The whole thing is illegal. Now, what I'm therefore trying to indicate is that when we say that authoritarianism accompanies extractive mode, this is only partly true because, because it's a travesty in many ways, uh, uh, this whole idea of liberal democracy, law, legal regime, labor rights, all that go with this, not only they go for the toss, but we must understand that this was always, and this is more and more now, the legality of the labor regime is only one part of the actually existing labor regime uh, uh, regimes uh, throughout the world. So the free labor, the contract bound labor, all that we take as granted and trade unions fight, uh, they only mean for, they means only this much. Uh, but in the world of extraction, mm, there the extraction of resources and the extraction of uh, the human body, energy, etc., uh, they go, uh, they go uh, hand in hand. Indeed, uh, there is one more thing on that. It is that if you see the development of cotton, Marx, in fact, wrote on cotton cultivation quite a lot. But if you think of uh, today's cotton cultivation drought in Maharashtra, uh, we are at Calcutta Research Group. We are now engaged in two studies. One, in fact, is the what is usually called the climate disaster because we had been uh, Bengal has been subjected to two massive cyclones in two successive years, 2020-2021, with few millions displaced. Uh, so, and what happens to them? Uh, but on the other hand, there is also, we are preparing a national report on drought and uh, displacement in India, which will show, again, what you may call ecological marginality, which is something which is directly related to, to the discussions uh, uh, discussion that we are having. Uh, therefore, you have the survival question, uh, the question of uh, climate and ecology, uh, uh, marginality of other kinds, and at the same time, uh, laboring bodies, and all this contributing to the to the to the uh, to the uh, development and the strengthening of an economy, which will thrive on combining uh, the most virtual forms of accumulation with the more with the. Uh, primitive forms of accumulation. And I think one of the important uh, uh, tasks of a workshop like this or a course like this would be to inquire what makes this combination uh, possible, the virtual and the most primitive. And therefore, 
in some way, if you recall, Marx was only commenting on Adam Smith's idea of primitive accumulation, and therefore it was so called. But I think we did not give uh, too much attention to the idea of this so called, because at one level, this idea of the primitive has done enormous damage to our historical understanding of what is actually happening, what is this that capitalism has to continuously do in terms of these things. I mean, think of land, and with this, I think my time is up, so we should have time for discussion. But if you think of uh, land, uh, if you go to this city called Hyderabad, now Hyderabad is a city where uh, Bill Gates uh, founded in India the most developed Microsoft uh, invested uh, uh, company. And we have there a, a, city, a city within a city. So the inner city, which neoliberal economy has turned upside down. If earlier, if you remember Paul Harrison's work on inner city, the inner city is a city of shanties, is a city of poor people, is a city where you know, the, the quote unquote, the civilized doesn't want to go during the night. But now you have a city within a city where you can reach from the airport completely. You, it's a 30 kilometer long stretch of road. You don't have to touch the land below. It's an elevated corridor. You go fast within you know, less than an hour, half an hour. You reach from the airport to the, what is called the Cyberabad. Cyber, you can understand, Bad is settlement. So the, the settlement of the virtual world, the settlement of the cyber world, and there you have all the high-tech company. So uh, with uh, Sandro knows of our research on the on the what is called the new cities or the new towns in India, and we found the same story: the story of disposition, the story of change in the land use pattern, the way in which the institutions of virtual accumulation uh, are uh, established. And uh, the, the whole thing is done on a turnkey basis. In other words, when there is the profit is good, the going is good, companies will come, they will have developers, the developers will set for them uh, absolutely on a turnkey basis, huge buildings and everything that Microsoft or other IBM and other giants would require. And then when the going is bad, they can leave it and go. So the workers, they don't have any designated employer. They don't have any identifiable boss against whom are they to fight, against whom they have to, you know, uh, raise their demands. And if you see the artisanal mining, uh, going back to that point, or if you see the way in which uh, riverbed mining goes on, sand mining, without which you cannot have the modern cities. So you have all these elements, and if you put them together, you can see that the proliferation of small scale artisanal mining, uh, uh, land becoming one of the most important elements of production today, apparently, which should not have been the case in the virtual uh, age of accumulation. The way in which labor mode is changing, labor is transforming, it shows that the classical distinction between the inside and the outside of capital, the periphery and the metropolis, these, I am not saying uh, to repeat, uh, these are not to be done away with. On the other hand, these distinctions uh, cannot be, you know, uh, 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 taken, uh, taken to an extreme. So in terms of politics, therefore, and finally, it is politics that interests me much more than any other thing. So I think it is in terms of politics that perhaps, maybe, we should go back again to those early days of colonialism and nationalism, or even, you know, the I'm thinking of, again, the 17th century England when the revolution failed. And this is not the Cromwellian revolution, but the revolution of the of the what was called the communalists of those days, revolutions of the, it's, it was a uh, uh, huge kind of rainbow assemblage of different segments of people 
affected by the advent of uh, this uh, mode of accumulation which world had never seen and uh, there was there is in fact one of the interesting sayings with which one can end uh, in barbados one of the early white uh, uh, shipmen the crew who again formed part of this uh, you know the motley crowd which wanted to rebel and rebel again and again making common cause with uh, market men and women laborers uh, cart pullers and others and soldiers and he said that after he stayed for i like, one and a half decade in barbados he is reported to have said uh, these englishmen uh, they are strange people even though i have come from that country they can make everything produce and the men are producing the blacks are producing the the local people are producing the whites are producing the land is producing everything they touch upon then turns into money and does something so i think therefore where does the limit of extraction end it's it's limitless as long as capitalism is there the idea that you can extract from everything that will lead to surplus is is ingrained in that it's not a question of insider thank you